Okay, thanks very much. And um, I'm sorry, perhaps, to bring people back to reality and what happens in libraries and institutions and some of the drivers, but I think it's interesting to think about that, so what we're actually handling on the ground at an institutional level in responding to various policy changes and so on, and where these tools like Altmetrics and others fit in or where they could fit in. And also, I think, how we go about trying to help the cultural change that's necessary with them um, in the research process. I hope you like the picture. I don't know if you recognise it. This is from the uh, Eclipse. Um, I think it was a late last year. Um, so this is one of our students took a lovely picture over the from the West Sands looking back to St Andrews. Um, so I, I do like this picture. And I, those who, of you who haven't been to St Andrews, I encourage you to come up and see us. It's, it's a wonderful place. So just going on, what I wanted to do first is just whiz through some of the um, policy drivers and, and what's happened. I mean, it's affected, obviously, the institution, but particularly the libraries and over the years. So if you look back to 2007, 2008, we obviously had the RAE, um, and there was a lot of uh, people exercising, collecting data and so on to submit for that. Um, and then we had a bit of a hiatus till the next ref, but since then, you know, 2010, 11, 12, lots of things have come in. So we've got the impact agenda, obviously, with the ref came in. We've had the EPSRC roadmap for making data open. Um, obviously, the other research councils are involved in that, but EPSRC are the ones who are really driving it and uh, making the institution think about implementing it. And we had a research outcome system for reporting uh, research outputs from research council grants and so on. Then in 2013, we had... Well, it's interesting, because I look back at the history of the RCUK Open Access Policy, and RCUK has been, had an open access policy, policy, I think, since 2004 or 2005. Oh, sorry, you can't hear me. Since 2004, 2005, but, and, and they updated it in 2013, really on the back of the, the Finch report to give it some more teeth, and obviously to provide institutions with money to support uh, the transition to gold open access, or actually, to be fair, to support open access, and institutions have um, either promoted gold or green or a mixture. Um, and the other things that came in as well rapidly, we've got the REF coming up. The REF, obviously, submission was in 2014. It's ironic that actually that's probably the only year where we don't worry too much about data collection and the quality of our data is the actual year that the um, submission uh, results come out because we actually submit obviously at the end of 2013 and then, then wait a year while well, I don't know how many of our top class academics spend how many days um, doing the, the review process again to, to come to the conclusions and, and um, obviously distribute the £2 billion pounds of money or whatever. But we also had, interestingly... Um, we changed from a research outcome system to another system for the research councils. We've had, obviously, in 2014, the other key driver was the HESI open access policy, which really changed the landscape uh, in terms of its requirement that when a uh, manuscript was accepted, you have to have it um, deposited into a repository within three months of acceptance, which is a very brave policy from HESI, and I personally support it wholeheartedly. I'm, I know some institutions don't, but I really think it's a game changer there. And from the, e the research data management point of view, it's interesting. Obviously, re EPSRC were asking us to provide a roadmap for research data management way back in 2012, but the policy didn't come into force until the 1st of May this year, um, and it took a little while for institutions really to realise this, this was important. So that's really trying to indicate that the policy is coming in that makes the, uh, as an institution, our collection and understanding of good quality research information really, really key. And the other aspect, of course, is the tuition changes down south. It's probably not affected us quite so much up here in Scotland, but it has had an effect on some of the drivers, the strategic drivers for all institutions in an age of austerity that some people have, have talked about. Um, and this, we have a, a pot of money for research, and that pot of money isn't going to grow. It's probably going to go, get less. So if you talk tie it back to the impact agenda, how does the government determine or the agencies determine who should get that money? So if you look at the institutional strategic need, We've obviously looking forward to the REF 2020. That's still the biggest stick around. Um, we're talking about asset e exploitation and impact, so going back to the, the topic of, uh, of today. And reputation and promotion is important. Benchmarking is a more competitive industry now. I mean, it's horrible words I'm using, but it is. It's a more competitive landscape. Um, and so this is important. And also the research income, it's not, so much, it's not just the compliance with the policies, it's also the demand management. The research councils are making us manage the demand um, that we, you know, we have to effectively put forward the proposals at an institutional level, not at an in individual level in many cases. So all that, um, we need the good quality information for that. So coming back to the library, 
then obviously as a library we have an opportunity to design and change our services to support the institutional priorities. Now this, um, I'm not a librarian, um, I, I've been trained in, so that's not a picture of me, this is a picture of, is it Madame Pince from Harry Potter? So the sort of traditional view of a li librarian who's sitting there quietly in a library and so on, um, is quite a, I think it's a very outdated um, view. And I think this view is probably much more the view that perhaps many of us would like to aspire to. I didn't put a picture of a nice pretty woman up there. I thought that would be too, going too far from, uh, from a, that point of view. But I think this is one of the areas that the uh, libraries are taking a lead on and should be taking a lead on. And if I look at some of the other areas from a strategic point of view that we have to be aware of, okay, it's great to think about how we d redesign or, or refocus our uh, um, services for this, but we have to be realistic. We have to think about the financial constraints. We've got less money now than we used to have. We have to think about the return on investment of our existing systems, our existing people, our existing in infrastructure. And if we're dealing with researchers, I'm sure all of you will understand this aspect here, that you have to keep the messages simple. Academics and researchers only want to know what they need to know when they have to know it. Because we can tell them again and again about open access, like research councils did in 2005. But until HEFSI policy came along, saying you have to do it if you want to go into the REF, that's when they start realising that they have to do it. So there's these big sticks that, that we need to use to help change the culture. So in St Andrews, what we've done is we've set up the new digital research division that I head up to try and bring some of the sort of disparate services, both around the institution and within the library together, to try and build the synergies and to keep the messages simple. So we've got open access, we've got um, elements of REF, we've got reporting to the research councils. Um, down here we've got the sort of research data management side as well to help um, researchers work on ensuring that they can find their data, they don't lose their data, it's resilient and so on, as well as the area of making um, data open. We've also brought the digital humanities area as well in because I think one of the things that we get hung up on is about open science, but it's open scholarship really, and I think the humanities side has more to offer in, in some areas than the, the science in terms of the sort of opportunities the, and the excitement you can engender with the academics, to be perfectly honest. And then we've got obviously the impact and the altmetric citations and so on, um, and infrastructure like ORCID. So I'll, I'll just go quickly through this. Those of you who've seen me talk before have probably seen this slide, but some people may not. This is just to give you an overview of our research information system at St Andrews in terms of uh, you know, what it's made up of. So we use Pure, which is the uh, CRIS system that Elsevier now have, having brought out the original um, makers, um, which is a small Danish company called Atira. What, so what we do is we bring corporate um, data in, this is synchronised in, we collect publications, whether by inputting, whether by um, harvesting it from various suppliers. Academics will also enter some publications, you know, for, for books and so on, where there are authority um, databases. We have activities, um, dissemination engagements and um, professional awards and so on. We link this to our full text repository which is hosted here at uh, Edinburgh in a consortia. Um, we have impact, this is the area that we're developing and I'll show you a few sh screenshots of that. Um, and we are also linking it through to data sets as well. And on here, obviously these are some of the areas that we're using this research information system for. Um, I mentioned snowball metrics as well, but also um, it's the impact, the public recognition, the, there's the exposing research at St Andrews as a, as a sort of a product, if you like. And also up in Scotland, we have the, the collaboration and research pools. And I think there are several, obviously, institutions in Scotland that you've used for another research information systems. And we, we are building uh, collaborative uh, websites. And we're also building in infrastructure links to things like Altmetric and Orchid and so on. So this is just showing you the sort of information that a researcher sees, because obviously I'm talking or have been mainly from an institutional perspective, but from a researcher's perspective as well, it's useful because they can see all this information in one place. The information that's brought in from the HR system, information that's brought in um, from uh, the, post, the, the students and so on, as well as the outputs and the funding and so on. And this is an example from a joint web, website with um, um, Edinburgh University, so St Andrews and Edinburgh have a collaboration called East Chem. So this information is coming directly from our system. So looking at the headline support, so this is what we use from a perspective of convincing our masters that we need to invest in this sort of system and embed it. We can support REF, 
Um, so here, this is a, a shot from Pure showing all the ref elements. So you've got all the different aspects of ref. I obviously haven't put any numbers in here because that would be sensitive information. But these are all the different areas of ref in terms of the formats of data that have got to be submitted. And we're also, as I say, looking at impact now. So we did collect impact for the ref, but it was just as some PDF um, case studies. We're now building up the ref um, more systematically and granularly in terms of um, looking at evidence, looking at capturing, oops, I'm pressing the, here so you can see um, evidence. Now interestingly, I looked at all the impact elements that we've got in the system so far and not many people put any evidence in, but obviously we need to encourage that. We've got the structures in place to capture that evidence and we can link it as well to the um, outputs and the activities and so on. So it starts to bring um, the impact in context and also to link it to the other parts of the information system. Open access, this is a very simple message again. What do we need to do? What the academics need to know is what they need to do and when they need to do it. So what we say is, right, as soon as you've got your manuscript accepted, put it into Pure and we in the library will take care of it. And I've got a member of the open access team from the library up at the top there who knows all about that. Um, research data management as well. Again, we're, we're uh, loading our research data that can't go elsewhere in other external repositories. This is going into our, our research information system. So for EPSRC, already on our portal, you can see some of the data underpinning articles that's available openly um, from, for, from our researchers. This is a rather clunky portal at the moment. We're actually updating the, the design of it and we'll shortly be launching that. But the, the data is there already. So research outcomes reporting, what we do here is we've got a, a project here, we're linking it through, we're catching key findings, and we're linking it to outputs and activities as well, and that's happening as well. Benchmarking and key performance indicators. Here, we're looking at uh, snowball metrics. Um, I'm not sure if many of you know about snowball metrics, you probably have heard of it, but the basis here is it's a, it's a standard definition of a set of metrics that's been designed from the university level upwards rather than the funders or the third party database providers effectively giving us metrics that they can provide. We're, we're trying to define clearly um, what metrics we need and from the institutional point of view and to understand how we're doing against our peers. Um, so it's agreed by the institutions, not imposed. And the critical thing, well, here's the, the just sort of some of the examples of the metrics that are available. It's all available on the Snowball Metrics website. Um, and there have been a couple of recipe books that have been published. Um, the important thing is, from our point of view in the, in the, in the project, is that, is that these metrics, the definitions of these metrics are made open, shared, openly available, anybody can use them, whether for commercial purposes or not. Um, and that's, that's critical because we want to share apples with apples. We want everybody, whatever system they're using, to be using these types of metrics. And I think also, crucially, it's not just about a single number, it's not, not just about looking at metrics in isolation is about looking at them to complement or to maybe what's the what's the opposite of complement uncomplement maybe peer review or expert opinion so we would always argue that you don't you just look at one metric or a couple of metrics you look at it in in the round of other things so it was started by research intensive universities it's often seen I think unfairly as an Elsevier project nobody's putting any money in um, either Elsevier or any of the institutions um, and the, we're working obviously closely with other institutions in the US and so on. And we're also working um, with some of the um, standards organizations, so CASRI, which has already been mentioned. And it's very good because the CASRI set up a snowball project and the membership of that, snow, that, that project includes representatives from digital science and from Thomson Reuters, so other system suppliers, which I think is really encouraging. Um, and we've also got the um, Snowball metrics are provided as a serif XML version for interoperability. So this is just an example, a snapshot. But, and this is sort of pilot version that just the, the, the partners can see. But the problem, of course, is we don't want to just benchmark with our fouls, you know, the eight universities. We want to benchmark with our peers, which might be within the UK, might be outside the UK. So what we're working on at the moment is providing effectively a freely available API to allow this information to be exchanged. And always um, the, 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 the philosophy is, as I as an institution say, I, can, I want to share my, my snowball metric with you and you can choose whether or not you want to share it with me. So there's that guarantee built in as well. 
So just looking back at the headline support, all this, of course, is great because everybody loves to be compliant, whether you're a research or institution, don't they? Well, I, well, maybe, maybe not. But I think underlying this, and this is really where the, these are sort of the sticks, the hooks that we can use to actually think about the bigger picture, which is really the crux of what I'm trying to say, I think, is all these sticks that are there, which we have to respond to, um, to a greater or lesser extent, I think do help us build in, um, and, and I think particularly the last point about using some of the services that we're, we're developing and the partnerships that we're building in the research process. And this is taking place, I would suspect, uh, in a lot of uh, research libraries across the UK and probably elsewhere, is getting back to maybe where research libraries should have been, should have, sh maybe were earlier, is actually building a partnership with the, with the researchers in the research process. Not just being stewards of what comes out at the end, but actually being partnership during the process and helping that cultural change. Because I think this is key to trying to get not just people ticking boxes and complying, but actually getting the fundamental cult cultural change that I suspect most of us in this room are interested in from an open science or open scholarship point of view. So just going to that point then, I think I like this picture. The only thing I don't like is it says science, because I think it should say scholarship, because science puts off half the researchers in the world, which is a bad thing. Um, and the arts and humanities and social sciences are just as important. And if anybody has ever heard Melissa Terra speak from UCL, yeah. the, the data is, their, their data is just as complicated and just as interesting as science data. So I'll just go through, quickly through these. These are just some of the um, references I'm sure we've seen about science going wrong. Um, some of it looking forward what we in our research information system, so we're looking at more interoperability, integrating with ORCID, more persistent identifiers, publication process, collecting the metadata earlier and in the systems and passing it along I think is really key and that's one of the exciting developments. And I think this is what I would say, I don't know if there are any publishers in the room, um, Chris vendors or standard bodies, I'm sure there are, but I think we need to work together to see how we can make this happen. So we're collecting the data once, um, we can use open standard profiles, open standard format with various persistent identifiers, make sure we're giving credit. And it was really interesting that, um, I can't remember the first speaker this morning talked about giving credit. You might want to have a look at this CASRI project here, which has got a proposed taxonomy of different types of credit, which is looking at all the different aspects in terms of software, analysis, data curation, and so on. And, that, and I think that's been the Wellcome Trust, um, Nature, and various other bodies have been involved in that. Um, and also about DOI, um, adding a DOI. At the moment, I think DOIs are usually added as acceptance, not always, but why not add a DOI before acceptance? I don't know. I mean, obviously, it might not get published, but does that matter? It's just having a standard um, identifier that can be passed throughout the system. So I'm just looking at some of these standards. So we've got CASRI, ORCID, SERIF, DOIs, CROSSREF, and FUNDREF. These are other infrastructure partners that we can work with. So just to finalise... <laughs> And to finish off, I think we need to take the weight off the researchers and, and, and uh, ha effectively work for a system where we do enter the data once and pass it through. And maybe we can get to the light at the end of the tunnel. What worried me a wee bit is it actually looked like a brick wall at the end or a stone wall at the end, but there's a little group of green there to get through. So anyway, thank you for listening. I should finish off. And one final thing, though, if you're like it in, up in Edinburgh this year, then next year we've got the Chris... Um, conference in St Andrews, just a wee bit further north. So, thank you very much for listening. Questions? Getting near the microphone. <laughs> Walking away, sorry. Yeah. of output and it seems to me that you're in an ideal position to start actually making audits and improvement loops within your research community 
that says here's a measurement of the quality of their treatments and plans over the last year or two, feeding that back to the practitioners who produced it so that they might improve their quality. Is that idea come across your radar at all? Well, not particularly, but I can see where you're going. I mean, that does sound a really interesting idea, absolutely. I, I think, <coughs> I suppose... It depends how you measure quality, because often for a proxy for quality is citation, right? Which is, well, that's a good, yeah. I mean, but not, not citation, not impact factors of journals, but effectively field-weighted citations um, within disciplines, which is of, often, is still the way we probably work. Now, we need to perhaps be educated away from that. And I think one thing which I'm sure is similar in other institutions, particularly in the UK, there is now a move to look at impact as a, um, you know, a, a effectively not just looking at the outputs that uh, a, an academic is producing, but looking at the quality of the impact. So both for engagement and for promotion, actually trying to use this as a cr criteria as well as, uh, as well as just the outputs. So it's not just the quality of the outputs we need to think about. It's also, I think, the, well, the quality, again, that's probably even more difficult, of, of the impact. But there's definitely um, moves afoot. I mean, if you take the REF, We've worked out at St Andrews a four-star impact case study was worth half a million pounds to us, which is a lot more than, I don't know how many um, four-star publications it equated to, but the senior managers, they see that and they realise, yes, this is important. We need to invest in uh, impact as well as pure outputs. So I don't know, that probably hasn't answered your question. But. Any more questions? Thank you very much, Alex.